Hello Revolution students and welcome back to another video on the Chinese Revolution Area Study 1. Uh, in today's video I am going to look at uh, the Yunnan Soviet. It was at the Yunnan Soviet, so if we think back to the Long March and uh, of and going back to some of those stats that I've looked at in the uh, Long March video of the 100,000 original Long Marches that left the Jiangxi Soviet only 8,000 of those managed to arrive at the Yunnan Soviet. Uh, however, uh, from those small numbers, uh, the CCP grew spectacularly while they stayed at Yunnan and as they spread their control throughout that region. And we're going to look at uh, the reasons why that occurred in this video now. So let's have a look. So the first key point here, when they got into Yunnan, uh, Mao Zedong and the CCP, they implemented a number of economic reforms in the region that they controlled in the Soviet. So for example, the first, one of the biggest ones, the most significant ones, are land reform. So from 1935 up to 1937, surplus land was taken from landlords and redistributed to peasants. And then from 1937, with the beginning of the Second United Front, um, the land reform policy was actually eased a little bit, and only surplus land left by absentee landlords was redistributed. So they moderated their uh, land uh, redistribution policies a little bit once they joined that Second United Front. The second key point, they introduced financial and tax reforms. So interest on loans and mortgages was reduced from 18% to 1.5% and rents could be no more than 25% of the harvest. So these were uh, huge gains for the uh, peasants who lived in the areas uh, uh, within the Yunnan Soviet. Landlords were also given tax bonuses for investing in local industry and if they had uh, if they had a son in the Red Army. So what Mao Zedong and the CCP were trying to do was they were trying to um, gain the support of as many uh, uh, sections of the population in at, or at the Yunnan Soviet as possible. They also introduced a number of social reforms such as women's associations were established to support abused women and poor women who could not feed their children. Um, evening schools were established for children and adults and this is a huge achievement of uh, the CCP in Yunnan. So literacy rates increased from 1% in 1936 to about 50% in 1943. So Education for the communists was always a, a key aim of the party, educating the people because uh, that was believed to empower the people. Uh, and we can see the results of uh, that there. Next, uh, one of the key works that Mao wrote while he was at Yunnan was On New Democracy. And it's in this work where he uh, define the revolution as a national rather than a class one. So where if we look back to the Hunan, uh, the, the Hunan report, uh, which was uh, which contained many of the key Maoist ideas, such as uh, the key class struggle was between peasants and landlords uh, in China. On new democracy, he softened some of those some of those ideas. So it tried to, rather than attacking the landlord, it tried to um, gain their support in order to uh, make the revolution a national one against the Japanese aggressor. Uh, Mao called for, and that links into this point here, Mao called for a broad revolutionary alliance of four classes. So you can see there the peasantry, the proletariat, the workers, the petty bourgeoisie, intellectual students and shopkeepers, small bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. And the national bourgeoisie were the, the loyal capitalists who didn't work with the Japanese and supported uh, uh, the national cause of ejecting the Japanese um, out of China to unite against the Japanese invaders. And all of these policies together contributed to the spectacular growth of the CCP during these Yunnan years. So we can see here, these policies contributed to a dramatic increase in popular support for the CCP. 
Party members increased from 40,000 in 1937 to 1 million by 1945, and the Red Army itself increased from 92,000 in 1937 to 860,000 in 1945. And these are just estimates, but they um, uh, they show that spectacular growth that occurred, and, and it was a consequence of these economic reforms and social reforms that occurred um, at the Yunnan Soviet. Um, Having a look at the image here, this is a photo of the Yunnan Soviet, and uh, it's, it's quite a desolate place. You can see uh, many of the houses were just dug into the hillside. Uh, one, I suppose, one of the most, uh, one of the most famous parts or identifiable, identifiable parts of the Yunnan Soviet was this pagoda up here. So if you ever get an image uh, in on one of our exams, and it doesn't give a clear or refer to it specifically as the Yunnan Soviet. But if it's got a pagoda like this, then it possibly is, probably is the Yunnan Soviet. And I've just got a key quote here, which I'll just go through as well. And this is from Tom Ryan. Although life at Yunnan was tough and lacking in material comfort, the Shan Gan Ning Soviet grew into a sizable state. So that's just another name for the Yunnan Soviet. 50 million people lived in the liberated areas by 1940. In one of my previous videos, um, that actually increased to over 100 million um, several years later. Yunnan was governed efficiently, was free of corruption and brought welcome benefits to its people. Peasants showed genuine respect to the Soviet government. The Yunnan period saw a considerable increase in party membership. And then he's just, there's those figures once again, which I've just quoted down here. Well, it's increased even more. Um, but that's just up to 1940. So that's, they're the, they're the, I suppose, the key points about the Inan Soviet. So one of the key reforms that I haven't discussed as yet was uh, was the uh, thought rectification campaign that occurred at Inan. Uh, and it's very, very significant because it was as a consequence of the thought rectification campaign that Mao Zedong was able to consolidate his leadership over the party and become the leader of the party. Many of the practices that uh, were involved in the thought rectification campaign, such as struggle sessions, um, uh, they were then used, we'll see later on, once the CCP got into power after 1949 during campaigns such as uh, the Hundred Flowers campaign, as well as the Cultural Revolution. So, um, We'll have a look at that now. So the Yunnan and the Zhongfeng, the Thought Rectification Campaign, began on the 1st of Feb 1941 and then continued through to 1945. So Thought rectific Rectification Campaign. So it's saying it sought to achieve ide ideological unity and political centralization within the CCP. And what that means was that everyone interpreted uh, revolution and ha a revolution and how to conduct revolution in China in the same way and pretty much in the way that Mao Zedong uh, wanted a revolution to be conducted within China. So, for example, that the peasants were the revolutionary class in China and their class enemies who they struggled against were the landlords. Uh, another consequence of the thought rectification camp rectification campaign was that it increased party discipline and political unity, you can see there, and it contributed to the CCP's ability to fight the Japanese and eventual success against the GMD in the Civil War. So the party became very disciplined, um, unified, uh, everyone, uh, the leaders followed what Mao asked them to do. It also initiated political repression of writers and artists. So those people who started to criticize either uh, Mao, the leadership, or the hierarchy itself uh, were, were repressed. And there's a couple of examples of these. So um, just quickly, so art and literature that Mao disagreed with was censored and its authors punished. And two key examples of those were Ding Ling and Wang Shuwei. Uh, Ding Ling if you remember, she was one of the key, key writers, individuals 
in the new culture movement and the faith, uh, May 4th movement. Wang Xinwei, Wang Xinwei um, he criticized the party. He was actually put into prison and then he was eventually when uh, the CCP fled from Yan'an, he was actually uh, executed by a CCP general. Another consequence of the Zhongfeng was that it further concentrated political power in the hands of Mao, as I was saying before. So and this is just a list of the, the extra positions he acquired as a consequence. So at the Seventh Party Congress in April 1945, Mao added to his position of chairman of the Politburo, the party's highest policy making organ, also the position of chairman of the Secretariat, the body through which the top party leaders controlled local party organisations. It was that body, um, the, chair, the Secretariat, that uh, elevated various party members to positions of power within the hierarchy. It, also, Mao's writings and speeches, formerly tit titled The Thought of Mao, Maoism, were proclaimed the sole guide for the CCP in the future. Um, it became CCP orthodox ideology. Mao is also credited with all the party's past successes. So the achievements of the party in the past, Mao is now uh, responsible for those. And then finally, it contributed to the cult of Mao, making him appear ideologically infallible. Ideologically infallible means he cannot make a mistake. His ideology, Maoism, was revolutionary truth. Um, and that's just the way it was, so you couldn't question it. All right, I've just got a key quote here. And this is just about the mass line. So this is a, um, one of the key Maoist theories, the mass line. Um, and it's from Tom Ryan, China Rising. According to Mao, good revolutionary leaders should take the ideas of the masses and concentrate them, then go to the masses, persevere in the ideas and carry them through so as to form correct ideas of leadership. And that's a very good, very good definition of the theory of the mass line. Above this quote, I've just put an image here of Mao Zedong at Yan'an and during the thought rectification campaign. And he, here you can see Mao Zedong sitting down with uh, local uh, CCP soldiers or uh, cadres and teaching them about correct revolutionary theory, teaching them Maoism. Okay, so that's that. Let's have a look at a couple of historical interpretations about uh, both the Thought Rectification Campaign, the Zhongfeng and Yan'an. So the first one here is by Morris Meisner and he writes, the acceptance or in some cases imposition of a common ideology no doubt contributed to the discipline and political unity that were necessary for survival in the long and bitter struggle against the brutalities of the Japanese invaders and then for success in the resumption of the civil war with the Kuomintang that inevitably followed. So uh, Meisner is arguing here that the Zhongfeng was a key contributing factor to the eventual uh, victory of the CCP over the Kuomintang in 1949. But the laying down of Maoist ideological orthodoxies also contributed to an extraordinary concentration of political power in the hands of the author, that being Mao Zedong. Perhaps it was a case where the imperatives of a harsh revolutionary war coincided with the political needs of the revolutionary leader. And then contrasting with that historical interpretation from Morris Meisner is one from Chang and Halliday. And this is also about uh, Yunnan and the Zhongfeng. Um, the, new, the newcomers were mostly enrolled in various schools and institutes to be trained and indoctrinated, but most very soon became disillusioned. The biggest letdown was that equality, the core of their idealism, was not only completely absent, but manifestly rejected by the regime. Inequality and privilege were ubiquitous. Every organisation had three different levels of kitchen. The lowest got roughly half the amount of meat and cooking oil allotted to the middle rankers, while the elite got much more. The very top leaders received special nutritious foods. So a key, a key, I suppose, 
plank of CCP ideology was equality. Um, and Yunnan was viewed by many as a utopia where everyone was equal and everyone shared the same hardships. It drew many, many people from many intellectuals from China to it, as well as, uh, uh, from, you know, people who were interested in communism from overseas. So foreigners, foreigners like Edgar Snow flocked to Yunnan to see what was happening there. Uh, but Chang and Halliday are arguing it was not uh, this sort of utopia. It was not a place of equality. It was actually a place of inequality where the lowest were exploited and those at the top of the hierarchy uh, were privileged. Anyway, that's our two uh, historical interpretations for Yunnan and the Zhongfeng. I hope you've enjoyed this video on uh, Yunnan and the Zhongfeng, and I hope it's useful for your study of the Chinese Revolution. And I shall see you next time. Goodbye.